Okay, so welcome back. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to invite Corina Uchigrai, who will talk about back group, cutting sequence, and Lagrange spectra. Before, before the, the starting of the talk, let me remind you that the, on the web page, there is a Google Doc document where everybody can write I think, as far as I understand, whatever they want, but <laughs> it should be focused on the, the, the way to, to escape from here. So uh, uh, on Saturday, maybe also f about tomorrow, so, okay, so, so that people can gather together and share some taxi and so on. Okay, so thank you. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for the invitation to be here. Is, it, uh, is the microphone working? Am I loud enough? Should I speak? OK. So I'm actually, as some of you know, I'm actually originally from Trieste. And so it's a great, even though I left when I was 18, so before I had scientific contacts with the city and the institutions of the city. So it's a great pleasure for me to be back in Trieste and give a talk in my home city. Um, so I've been to some of the dynamical system conferences that have been given here. So. Uh, and what I do is more dynamics than geometric theory, but I try to find some topic that has, which has more geometry and some groups uh, in, the, in the talk. Okay, so first I want to remark that uh, mm, the work that I'm going to talk today about two works, which are joint works. The first is a joint work with uh, Diana Davis and Irene Pasquinelli. And this is a work on cutting sequences on beach surfaces. I'll tell you what this means in a second. And uh, the second is a joint work with Mauro Artigiani and uh, uh, Luca Marchese. So I'm going to put the names here. I should have done it earlier. So these two works, both are works on beach surfaces, with, on dynamical properties of beach surfaces, both of which involve the study of the which group action on the space of affine deformations of a which surface. So that's why I'm going to talk about them toge together. And the outline, I will spend some time at the beginning because this is not uh, a common background for this type of audience. I spend some time about basics on what is a which surface and which group. And then I'll introduce the first result on cutting sequences. I'll introduce and motivate the second result on Lagrange spectra, which are also, in the title I had penetration spectra. It's actually the same thing, Lagrange penetration spectra. And then I'll try to give you some ideas of the proofs of the two results. So it will be back and forth between the two topics, and you'll have several occasions to wake up and catch up if you got lost in some part. Okay, so time to do some background. So I know that the students who were here last week had a course with Pascal Hubert, so you're probably all well prepared on what are translation surfaces. So actually, the best description for me, it's the easiest. So you take a polygon, which has pairs of parallel sides, isometric parallel sides, glued together, like A with A, B with B. So in this case, we have a surface of genus two, glued out to a regular octagon. So this is the regular octagon surface. And whenever you get a surface out of gluing polygons, your surface naturally carries a flat metric. So apart from possibly finitely many points, which come from the corners of your polygons, and this is the set of singularities, sigma. So outside these finitely many points, in my case, all the vertices of the octagon are a unique point in, on the surface. Outside this point, you have every other point has a locally Euclidean neighborhood and changes of coordinates in your manifold definition are given by translations in complex coordinates z goes to z plus c. So this is why we call those translation surfaces. And at the singularities, the special points, we have an excess of curvature, because we are on a surface of higher genus, so there should be some negative curvature. And these points are conical singularities um, called, uh, where the model, if you want, is z goes to z to the k. So it's a, a k cover of the plane. So on translation surfaces, there's a well-defined notion of lines. So the geodesics are flat lines. 
And you can talk about directions. So I can say there's a line in direction theta. Direction is well defined, apart from the singular point. At the singularity, so what's happening? Am I too far? Yes. At the singularity, there could be many lines in the same direction which hit this point. So this point, you can think of it as a saddle on your surface. So these are how linear trajectory looks on the surface. And again, we are thinking of surfaces, not polygons. So two polygonal presentations of the same surface are, two polygonal presentations are equivalent and give you the same surface if you can cut and paste your polygons by translations. For example, in my picture, you see you can take this surface and uh, uh, cut and paste the polygon and you will get again the same flat metric on the, on the same surface of genus two. Okay? Okay. So if we have two translation surfaces, we can look at affine diffeomorphisms among them. Okay, maybe I should have said an affine, it's a, um, I missed something, it's a um, continuous map, it's a homeomorphism which actually maps singularities to singularities, and it's affine in each chart. So it's a linear, it has a linear part plus constants, and the linear part is independent on the point. And I can look at self-affine maps from a surface to itself. These are affine automorphisms of S. And the group, this is a group of affine automorphisms. And the which group, I'm too far, the which group is the group of linear parts. So I look at these affine maps and they look just at the linear part. So a linear part will be given by a matrix. And these matrices, be, I find if you automorphisms have to be area preserving. I'm not assuming necessarily that they are orientation preserving. It's not standard. So they are actually matrices in SL2R plus minus. So two by two matrices with the terminal plus or minus one. Possibly I can also use reflections. Okay? So let me give you an example. So if you take the square torus, like here, I claim that the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1 is in the which group. So if I apply 1, 1, 0, 1, that's actually a shear. Or if you want, it's a full then twist in the, of the square. But after I shear my square, I can actually cut and paste it back to a square, square. Uh, to a parallelogram can be cut and pasted back to a square. So this shows that uh, this gives me a self-automorphism of the torus into the torus, with derivative 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Here's a more sophisticated example. So if you take the regular octagon, I claim that this matrix is in the which group. So this is also a shear, where here the upper entry is here. So if I apply to my octagon this matrix, what I get is a sheared octagon. It's this black figure here. And this is a sheared octagon. And I drew it inside a grid made by pieces of the original octagon. Because I want to show you that, like in a jigsaw puzzle, you can rearrange these pieces of the sheared octagon back into the standard octagon, OK? I'm wondering whether Pascal Hubert showed this example in the course. No? OK. Um, OK, so this matrix gives you an affine automorphism, where you shear and then cut, cut and paste back. OK, so we want to focus today on translation surfaces which have plenty of self-affine uh, automorphisms. Those are which surfaces. So a surface, we say that it's a which surface, or also lattice surface, if the which group is a lattice in SL2R. So again, uh, the same two examples. If you take the torus, you can add to this. You can either add the other uh, twi then twist, vertical then twist, one, zero, one, one, or this is actually a rotation, and you get the full SL2Z, which is a lattice in SL2R. And for the octagon, uh, you can take, for example, you can take, here I took two, uh, I like these reflections which have determinant one. This is a horizontal reflection, this is a slanted reflection. So all isometries of your polygon will in particular give you a fine self-automorphisms, right? So I can put isomet isometries in, and then I can put this non-trivial element that we saw together, and this will generate a lattice in SL2Z. So 
regular, regular octagon surface is a beach surface. And this one. So this is a little bit of introduction because motivate people. People have, in like Muller dynamics are very interested in beach surfaces because they are interesting from the dynamical point of view. They satisfy a dichotomy that all trajectories are either, by infinite trajectories, are either periodic or dense and uniformly distributed. I don't want to spend time. This is just a motivation. And also, if you look at the SL2R action, they generate closed orbits known as Teichmuller curves. I'll tell you more later on in the proof part. And um, people have tried to list, classify beach surfaces. So we saw that the square and the octagon, and more in general, any regular polygon will give you a beach surface. And this is a seminal paper by Vich where he defined which groups and discovered which surfaces. There are some examples which were found by Ward. And then, a little bit more than 10 years ago, there were two infinite families of which surfaces, which were discovered, um, one by Bo and Moller, by Bo and Moller. This is the Bo-Moller family. And another family was discovered independently by Kalta and McMullen. It's a family of L-shaped which surfaces in genus 2. And the bow molar surfaces, I will focus on them today, so I will tell you more about them. And then uh, Mukamel gave a talk on Tuesday here. I think he didn't say he talked about the Gothic locus. In, and in the Gothic locus, there are infinitely many new witch surfaces, which have a cathedral shape. And there's also research and people working on proving that there are finitely many with fixed complexity, genus and singularities. And OK, there's a whole research. So as I said, apart from uh, these classical examples, uh, uh, the bow molar surfaces have, are kind of, uh, have beach groups which are triangle groups, while this L-shaped family of surfaces have more complicated beach groups that actually Mukamel has studied, I guess, uh, Ronan has studied. So I want to focus on the bow molar. Uh, after, poly after regular polygons, they are the nicest kind of family. And they are obtained by gluing a collection of polygons which are semi-regular. So this is a, the, all these polygons together glued according to the numbering that you see, one with one, six with six. This is one surface, and this is another surface. And this, uh, let me first say that this is um, a Pat Hooper polygonal presentation. So Hooper discovered this simple polygonal presentation of these uh, beach surfaces. So first of all, beach surfaces uh, sorry, Baumoller surfaces are parametrized by two indices, M and N. So the SMN surface, the MN Baumoller surface, is made by M semi-regular polygons, each of which has a symmetry of order 2N. So look here. So this is S43. So there are four polygons which have order 6 symmetry. So these are semi-regular hexagons. So the angles are equal, but the sides come in two lengths. And these are triangles, but they have still order six symmetry. Oh, no, order three. I think I said it wrong. OK, sorry. Uh, maybe I should have said three. OK. Uh, and this is S34, where there are three polygons with order four symmetry. And you have to pick the lengths specifically. So they are not any two semi-regular. You have to pick them carefully because you want the surfaces to have a global shear, like the one in the octagon that I showed you before. And maybe I could have said about the octagon that this shear, you can think of it as a simultaneous dent twist. So the octagon has two cylinders, and you're doing a dent twist in each, but the cylinder moduli are commensurate, so you can do this dent twist simultaneously. And here you have cylinders, and you want to, do, to be able to do a simultaneous dent twist in each cylinder to get a globally defined uh, shear on the surface. Okay. Okay, so this is as much as I wanted as an introduction. I go too far and then I cannot click. Okay, and I'm too close maybe, I don't know. Okay, so now it's the first result I want to talk about. It's about cutting sequences. So if you have a witch surface and you want to, first of all, give names to uh, the pairs of sides which are glued. For example, in the octagon, I'm using the alphabet A, B, C, D to label the sides. And if I have a bi-infinite linear trajectory, oh, what am I doing wrong with this clicker? I think, I will, okay. This, this is a, an example of a, bi, of a trajectory, linear trajectory. You go out and come back. And 
I want to associate to a linear trajectory a sequence of symbols to kind of give a symbolic coding of the trajectory. And this is a sequence in the alphabet A, B, C, D called cutting sequence. And the idea is just that you look at the sequence of sites that you hit as you travel along your line. So in my example, this, I hit A, so I record an A. Then I hit a B, so I record a B. Then I hit another B, then I hit an A, then I hit a C, okay? So that's the cutting sequence of a trajectory. And I only want to look at bi-infinite trajectories that give me bi-infinite cutting sequences. So the problem I want to talk about is how do you characterize these cutting sequences among all sequences in the alphabet? And what do I mean? Maybe I should say that cutting sequences are rare. I mean, if you flip a coin, actually you cannot flip a coin with four letters, so if you throw a tetrahedron dice and at random, you will get random A, B, C, D. But here, the sequence that you get is very far from a random sequence because it has a lot of uh, structure and it has actually very low complexity compared to a random sequence. So if I give you a sequence, how can I tell if it is the cutting sequence? And how can I build cutting sequences? Well, not drawing the lines by hand. Uh, I really have issues with this. OK, so just to say that this is a problem which, in the case of the torus, is very classical. Because in the case of cutting sequences for the torus are actually, well, first of all, you can think of them as just uh, how a line hits sides of a square grid, where you record by A and B, horizontal and vertical sides. And these cutting sequences um, are called Sturmian sequences. They have been studied by Hedlund and Morse more than a century ago. And they have the lowest possible complexity among non-periodic sequences. I don't want to tell you what that means. But they're famous. So apart from Sturmian sequences, there are nice references for their characterization. There's one way to see geometrically by Caroline series. That I strongly, strongly recommend this paper on mass intelligence, and I give it to many of my undergraduate students as a project to read because it's beautifully written. Or there's another characterization more combinatorial by Arnoux that I will tell you about today. And then, a few years ago, in joint work with John Smiley, we managed to give a similar characterization for octagon cutting sequences and two n-gons, polygons with even number of sides inspired by this uh, uh, series work. And um, uh, also Ferenczi uh, characterized the language of these uh, uh, cutting sequences for regular polygons. And after our work, there was kind of a surge in interest. So Diana Davis and Diana Davis with Cotters, they looked first at the pentagon and then at uh, uh, odd gons. So you have to take two polygons with odd number of sides to glue them together, so double odd, odd gons and found that our kind of similar characterization goes through. And there were some other works. And Diana Davis had some partial results on this Baumoller family. This. So what I'm going to talk about, the result that I'm going to talk about is that um, it's about the Baumoller family. So which is in some sense the next step up uh, from regular polygons. Because the, for regular polygons, the which group is a triangle group with one elliptic point, and for Bohm Muller, you have a triangle group with two elliptic points. So I will see that later. And um, I think it gives a fairly good intuition of what would be the general picture. So the substitutions, uh, sorry, these uh, characterizations will be in terms of substitutions and what I call S adic systems. That's a language that people in word combinatorics like and especially people in Marseille, uh, like Arnoux and um, also Valérie Berthe. Okay, so let me tell you what's a substitution maybe you've seen in your life, I don't know. So it's a substitution from, on an alphabet A, it's a map which to each letter of the alphabet associates a word. So for example, these are the two Sturmian substitutions, sigma zero and sigma one. So sigma zero maps A to A and B to AB. So to each letter you associate a word. And this is sigma one. And su substitution, then the action extends on words or sequences by just a position. So uh, if I want to find sigma zero of, oh, sorry, this should be AB. I changed zero one to AB. So sigma zero of AB uh, is 
sigma 0 of A and sigma 0 B, so it's A, A, B, and so on. So you just apply to each letter, to each letter you substitute a word. Uh, that's another example of applying sigma 0 squared and then applying sigma 0 squared to sigma 1 cube. And by applying sigma 0, actually this is a piece of a Sturmian sequence. Okay, so people often look at sequences which are fixed by a substitution, so sigma of omega is equal to omega. But if you have a word which is a fixed point of a substitution, you can actually produce it as a limit by taking some letters, you have to choose the initial letter suitably, and applying the substitution many, many times. So as you apply the substitution more and more times, you get longer and longer blocks, sigma to the n of L. And you can imagine if these longer and longer blocks stabilize and converge, the limit sequence, you, uh, you, they, they can converge towards the limit. And you call this kind of the... What do you mean? Uh, uh, here, I'm just talking about substitutions. Yeah, so, yeah, there's a linear flow. I'm, I'm going to study uh, cutting. Maybe you're going too far ahead. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So, one second. Okay. But I don't want to talk about fixed points of substitution. But I want to talk about sequences generated by finitely many substitutions. So these are s adic. So s. I take S to be a finite set of substitutions, and then look at products of these finitely many substitutions. So you can look at limits where I take some pick from this set substitutions and apply them. And then I get longer and longer blocks. Okay? I can apply however I want my substitutions. And if I get something which stabilizes, and actually I do if you grow your sequences towards the middle, so you the, you will get sequences which actually stabilize and converge with, towards the limit. So if a word has a limit, can be obtained by longer and longer products of the set S of substitutions, I say that the word, uh, the sequence has a S adic expansion. Okay, so S adic expansion. So Sturmian sequences can be characterized by S adic expansions. So a word is a Sturmian word, or it's a cutting sequence of the square. Actually, I should say it's in the closure. So we always characterize the closure of the set of cutting sequences. If there exists a sequence of integers such that uh, the, the, the word the infinite sequence can be obtained, it has an esadic expansion. And here I'm alternating sigma 0 and sigma 1. Sigma 0 and sigma 1 are the Sturmian substitutions that I showed you before. And I alternate, first I apply sigma 0 a0 times, sigma 1 a1 time, then again sigma 0 a2 times, and so on. And actually, this is, if I can write every sequence as a, with an s adic expansion, I say that uh, this is an s adic characterization. And I should say this word s adic was uh, due to Ferenczi, and it reminds of Vershik adic maps. And this AK actually have a meaning dynamically. They turn out to be the continued fraction entries of the slope of your line in the plane. So they have a, and they can, they can recognize them combinatorially. Okay, so this is the type of characterizations I'm gonna look for. And as I said, the first main result is about uh, bow moller cutting sequences. So, <coughs> If you take a bow molar surface and label the sides, uh, in this joint work with Diana and Irene, we show that you can actually write n minus one times n minus one substitutions, and we have a recipe to actually produce them, so that a word, an infinite sequence is in the closure of the cutting sequences on the bow molar surface. If and only if there are in the, actually this, I parameterize this. Uh, substitutions on two indices for reasons that maybe will be clear later. And if I have an s adic expansion with the substitutions, okay? So this is an s adic characterization and you can use it to build, to actually have a recognition algorithm to know if a finite block is actually a part of a cutting sequence or not. And you can recover, uh, this is a typo, this should be, this indices can be recovered combinatorially and uh, 
uh, you can interpret them as a continued fraction, generalized continued fraction. Okay, so this was the first result. I hope you are still with me. So you can wake up if you are lost because there's a new topic, so the, which is the second result on which surfaces, and then we'll go through the tools in the proofs. So this is the Lagrange, Lagrange spectrum part. So Lagrange spectra are a generalization of a classical object in number theory. But uh, I'll first give you the general definition that I want to use and then tell you what it is in the classical case. So it's again a geometric object for me. So it's a, I take a translation surface and set of connections on the translation surfaces are uh, lines which go from a saddle to a saddle, from a singularity to singularity without hitting singularities in the middle. And if I have a set of connection, I can represent it in the plane like a segment, and the displacement vector or holonomy vector is just the difference between the endpoints. So it's really this vector in the plane, okay? So this is the holonomy of a set of connection or displacement. So if I fix a direction on my translation surface, and I have a set of connection, I want to define one more thing, the area of the set of connection in that direction. So I'm going to take a, this area to be an area of a rectangle, which has the set of connection as a diagonal, and the sides are parallel to theta and theta orthogonal. Okay? So this area is the area of the set of connection in direction theta, the light blue area. And if you want, you can rotate the direction to make it vertical, and then it's real-time imaginary part. OK, so what is the Lagrange spectrum? So if I fix a direction theta, I want to look at set of connections which are uh, more and more in direction theta, and look at the areas of these set of connections, and take the limb soup of one over the area. So maybe I have one better picture. So you see, as I take set of connections which are, are better and better approximations of the vertical, and look at the rectangles which I can inscribe, and take these areas. And I want to take the smallest areas as I grow. So to make the limb soup big, I need the area of one over, I need the area to be small. So I'm searching for set of connections in that direction with small area, okay? And this is the Lagrange value in direction theta. The Lagrange spectrum is the collection of Lagrange values as theta changes. So it's going to be a set of numbers. Yes? Ah, yes, of course. I should have said that. Uh, absolutely. So these rectangles, when I draw a rectangle, I mean, and um, so there are no, it's actually a flat rectangle, so there are no other singularities in. But actually, okay. Actually, maybe you don't need to require it here, but in, in, in reality, the set of connections which minimize the area are the ones which come with an embedded. Well, okay, no, but let's say so it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so there is a more general definition for SL2R invariant Locci lot of uh, translation surfaces that we gave in joint work with Kubert and Marchese, but no, this is a special case. And this is a generalization of the classical Lagrange spectrum. So if you take your surface to be the square, the unit square surface, then it turns out that this is a well-studied object, which has also a def definition in terms of Diophantine approximation. And that's maybe the, it's, uh, you can look at denominators of continuous fractions. Okay, I don't want to. There's a Diophantine approximation. And there is also a geometric meaning in terms of penetration spectrum. So if you look at the modular surface with hyperbolic geodesic flow, actually, the, uh, you can take a ray, in a geodesic ray in a certain direction, theta, and you can look at excursions into the cusp. So you want to know how far you go in the cusp. And you can measure excursions through uh, a, system, a proper function, which goes to infinity in the cusp, and I want to use the saddle connection flat system. So this is the shortest length of a flat length of a saddle connection on the torus. And what, uh, th these values can also be computed as the limb soup of 2 over systole squared along my Tech-Muller ray. So I look at 2 over systole squared. So remark actually now that a typical geodesic will go arbitrarily far in the cusp. So the systole will go to zero. 
And this number will go to infinity. So this value is actually infinity for a typical geodesic. The only geodesics for which it's finite are bounded geodesics or closed geodesics. So closed geodesics stay at a fixed height in the cusp. And then what you're measuring is the maximal asymptotic excursion. So you're kind of measuring the diameter of uh, uh, the limit set of your geodesic. So th this is why this spectrum is called the penetration spectrum. OK, this is, if you didn't get it, it's OK. It's just a motivation about the classical case. So what is known about the classical spectrum? This classical Lagrange spectrum had been studied for more than a century. So we said it's a subset of real line union infinity. And for most values, it's actually infinity. But uh, people, I mean, OK, it's closed. And it's the closure of quadratic irrationals, which correspond to closed geodesics on the modular surface. And the minimum, it's square root of 5. It's uh, uh, called Hurwitz constant. So there is a minimum. It's my blue dot to the left in my line. That's my li real line. Minimum is there. And the beginning, up to 3, there are discrete values. So those are called Markov numbers. Then the, that's what I want to care about today. From some point on, this oh, Lagrange spectrum contains a full interval. So from a value, the, actually the best value is the Friedman constant. From here on, the full uh, semi-line is contained in the Lagrange spectrum. And what about in between the discrete part and the interval? The, this interval is called whole ray. And in between, the structure is quite complicated. It's like a Cantor-like structure. And there are recent results by Moreira on the house of dimension. OK, so this is the picture of the classical Markov spectrum. Discrete beginning, whole ray, and complicated middle. So there were many generalizations of Lagrange spectra to Fuchsian, other Fuchsian groups, higher dimensional, hyperbolic, uh, manifolds, Bianchi groups, by many people. And for translation surfaces, some properties we proved in this first paper with Hubert and Marchese. And for example, the Hurwitz constant was recently announced by Boschernitzan and Delacroix. So what I want to prove, talk about today is uh, the whole ray. So what we proved with Mauro Artigiani and Luca Marchese is that this whole ray phenomenon persists for any beach surface. So take any beach surface, look at the Lagrange spectrum, then the Lagrange spectrum of any beach surface will contain a half ray. So there will be an R from which all values are at the, up, up, uh, achieved. OK? So like this. Actually, the proof uses which groups and arguments by Hall and a symbolic coding like continuum fraction. But I, I hope to get there a little bit later. OK. So now I finish the statements part. So we have a result about cutting sequences on beach surfaces, especially bow molar surfaces and a result about Lagrange spectrum. Okay? So now I want to give you some tools from the proofs. Any questions now? Yes? Ah? In arbitrary? So the... So actually I'm kind of lying because there is something called the Markov spectrum which is similar to the Lagrange spectrum, but instead of LLM soup, you take a soup. And people have studied the Markov spectrum for other Fuchsian groups. And there is actually, maybe I should have actually, this is I should really say. So there is a result by Shergon and Schmidt where they proved the whole ray for Markov spectra. But there is quite a big difference in, ah? Uh, so, OK, there are different definitions. So if, say that you want something which has cusps. So if you want to talk about penetration spectra. But OK, if you have a rich surface, you always have cusps. But uh, yes. Uh, actually, I should say, so for this Markov spectra, there are results about the beach, the uh, whole ray. But in some sense, if you want to achieve a soup, it's easier than if you want to achieve something which gets to that value infinitely often. So yeah, so this actually creates some confusion. But yeah, so our result, so yeah. But those meet with them, they, they say they tried to understand whole ray for uh, Lagrange and they couldn't. So, okay. <coughs> yes? Is it possible to 
Yes, so this is true also here. So we are also talking about penetration spectra on, okay, you'll see which, on, on what? On the Teichmuller curve. Absolutely. So both motivation, the Diophantine motivation also generalizes. It's a Diophantine problem for interval exchange transformations, that's, which are the analogous of rotations for, okay, that's another thing that I like to do, but, and uh, uh, it's also the geometric motivation is penetration spectra generalized. That's why we study this Lagrange spectra. Okay, so the first key picture, if you have a Vich surface and a Vich group, you want to look at the space of affine deformation of your Vich surface. So you might have heard from Ronen and from last week, you can act on a translation surface by SL2R, by applying the matrix, a matrix to each polygon and uh, gluing after applying a linear matrix, parallel sides are still parallel, you can still glue them. So there is an SL2R action, and I want to look at the space of affine deformations, and I'm going to define it like this. I'm going to think of marked affine deformations as triples of diffeos from a fixed S0 to S. And I'm going to say the two triples, two marked triples are equivalent if I can find a translation equivalence which makes this diagram commute. And something is wrong here. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so the space of marked affine deformation is actually isomorphic to S SL2. And uh, SL2 is like the unit tangent bundle of the unit disk. So you can picture yourself this disk, the unit tangent bundle of this disk, as all possible affine deformation, marked affine deformations of the surface. You can actually place uh, the standard triple. Your surface, you can think of it as the center of the disk. And as you apply a matrix in SL2R, you move on the disk. And the which group acts on a marked affine deformation by changing the marking. And it, and it acts actually on the disk by Mabius transformations. And you can take the quotient of uh, this uh, disk by the action of the which group. And this is an example of a tessellation of the disk where the fundamental domain is the Vich group. And the quotient is the space of affine deformations. And this quotient will be a the unit tangent bundle of a hyperbolic surface with cusps. And this hyperbolic surface with cusp is the Teichmuller curve associated to your Vich surface, okay? So I want to think of Teichmuller curves as space of affine deformations of a Vich surface. And remark, this is not the case if I take a random translation surface, then the space of affine deformation will be much larger. It will be the whole, um, the closure will be, the closure will be typically the whole modular space, but this is true for which. Okay, so this picture will be useful. And I want to do some kind of, uh, use the action of the which group on this disk to understand my uh, dynamical properties. So I want to explain some ideas from how you characterize cutting sequences first. So the first three slides will not have the disk, but then I will show you the disk, how it enters into play. And I'm going to do a simplification. I, as I said, the result I want to talk about is Bohm-Muller classification, characterization. But I want to tell you first some ideas from the octagon case, from our work with Smiley, which are easier. And then I will tell you the difference and novelty in the Bohm-Muller case. Okay, again, you can start listening from here if you are lost for now. So, so if I give you this octagon, so I'll talk about the octagon and then explain the difference with bohm -Muller. So let's go back to the regular octagon and to cutting sequences on the regular octagon. So first, using isometries of the regular octagon, I can assume that the linear trajectory I want to study has slope in the sector zero pi over eight. So this is this blue sector, right? I can always apply an isometry and bring it back there. So first I want to do an elementary observation that there are clear restrictions of what a cutting sequence can do. So I want to look at possible pairs of letters or transitions. So which pairs of letters can follow each other given that my trajectory has a slope close to horizontal. For example, if my trajectory hits the side A and has slope in this sector, it's bound to hit D after A. So it cannot go anywhere else than D. So from A, I can only see D. 
But if I hit this from the side D, I have a choice. I depends on how I come and what my slope is. I could either hit A or I could hit B. So from D, I can go to A or to B. Those are both allowed transitions. And similarly, you can record which other um, restrictions there are. And you get a little diagram, which I call transition diagram. And by elementary geometric restriction, if I have a cutting sequence, it has to give me an infinite path on this diagram. OK? Because it's forced to. Of course, that's far from being a characterization, but it's a first necessary condition. And the idea is that renormalization allows you to multiply this condition on different scales. That's what's going to happen. So first, you have to do your exercise. If you have other sectors, you can get just permutations of the same diagram. So these are all diagrams which correspond to the eight possible sectors. The other half is symmetric, so I don't need to care about it. And if I give myself a cutting sequence just by looking on which, so it will uh, give me an infinite pass on at least one, at most two of these diagrams. Okay? So you can kind of recognize the sector already by just this elementary observation. Then there is a non-trivial operation. So I want to say a combinatorial operation which is called derivation. And derivation will be an anti-substitution. So you remember, a substitution grows the, num the, the length of words. Derivation will shrink the length of words. And we will find substitutions as anti-derivations. So if I have a cutting sequence on the octagon, I can say, I want to say that the derived sequence consists of the sequence of sandwich letters. What are sandwich letters? So sandwich letters are letters preceded and followed by the same letter. So here A is sandwiched between Ds. B is sandwiched between Cs. And I can run through my sequence and search for sandwich letters and keep only those. So the, the right sequence consists of only the sandwich letters in my sequence. It's a short, well, shorter. It reduces length of finite blocks. And so in Smiley, we show that the derived sequence is, again, a cutting sequence. If I start from a cutting sequence, the derived sequence is a cutting sequence. So it has to be admissible on one of the diagrams. And conversely, substitutions are like anti-derivation. So if I know the arrival sector, so if I know in which diagram the derived sequence is, uh, admiss is uh, leaves, then I can reconstruct uh, my original sequence by a substitution. So there are eight substitutions, so that if the derivative lives in the i's transition diagram, the original sequence is substitution i of the derived sequence. So derivation is not uniquely invertible, but if I know where I land, I can invert it through a substitution. Okay, that's the key step uh, that I want to bring forward. Work for on goals, and they are not really substitution; they are actually substitution on transitions. So you can think of them as uh, you have to change alphabet if you want to really call them substitution. And in our first paper, we don't talk about substitution. You can think of them as morphism of the transition diagram. So an arrow is mapped to a sequence of arrows. So this combinatorial operation of derivation is nothing else than the symbolic effect of an affine automorphism. Actually, of the affine automorphism that we saw before, that stretches the octagon. So this is the geometric meaning of derivation. The, you remember this matrix that we saw that sends the octagon in a sheared octagon? So the claim is that to see that the right sequences of cutting sequences are cutting sequences, you, you can prove that if I take a cutting sequence in this basic sector, the derived sequence is the cutting sequence of the same trajectory with respect to the sides of the shear octagon. So the shear octagon will hit my sequence less often. And the sandwich letters are exactly the ones which hit the sides of the shear octagon. And then, if I want to renormalize, if I apply my affine diffeo, which sends the shear octagon back to the octagon, I change the slope of my trajectory, but I still have the, the, the right sequence is the cutting sequence of a new trajectory on the regular octagon. Okay? So I can then repeat my procedure. Fine. 
Now it's time to see uh, the, the disk picture. So this is the disk, like Muller disk of the octagon. So the center is the octagon, which is the symmetry of order eight. And this is the fundamental domain, for the tessellation given by the which group of the octagon. It's, it's an ideal tessellation in ideal octagons. And all the red vertices, which have order eight symmetries, are sheared octagons. So they are cut and paste equivalent to uh, the center, to the regular octagon. So you can think of them as sheared octagons. And if you choose as generators of the which group, I choose generators of isometries times this gamma, this shear, basic shear. And this is, this is the Kyle graph, and I want to, this is the tree of moves that I want to use. So here I can do use reflections or rotations in the Dakila group, and to move along a segment, I use my gamma or a conjugate of gamma. So the, from the center, these are the possible moves I can do. So if I want to study a trajectory of a direction on the octagon, uh, sorry, a trajectory on the octagon in direction theta, I'm going to look at the geodesic ray which points to theta in the Tegmuller disk. And I'm going to shadow this uh, ray with a sequence of moves from my tree. So I'm going to look at group elements which approximate my geodesic. And it will go through a sequence of octagons. It will grow to a sequence of vertices. And I claim that if I derive my sequence, what I'm getting are cutting sequences with respect to these stretched octagons. So these octagons which approximate my geodesics will be stretched in the direction of my direction. And derived sequences are just describing how I hit the stretched octagons. And how do I find my substitutions? If I, I can actually label this tree with numbers from zero to seven, and the path that I'm selecting, it's telling me which substitutions I have to use to invert the derivation. So if my labels will be uh, I zero, I one, blah, 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 then my original sequence is the nth derivative with these substitutions backwards. So this is how you find your s adic expansion for the octagon. It's a triangle group with actually infinity, infinity, n. So it has one elliptic point and two parabolic elements. Thanks for this question, because now what is the difference with Baumoller? Well, Baumoller has, again, a triangle group, but it has two elliptical elements. So SMN has two elliptic points. It's a MN infinity triangle group. So it has one parabolic point and two points of order M and order N. So indeed, that's the, uh, why it's kind of harder than the uh, square. And actually, what are the green vertices? The green vertices are, say, the three, four. In my picture, they are the three, four uh, surface, which has order four symmetry. And what are the red vertices in this disk? Actually, it turns out that on the same disk, there are also copy, affine copies of the four tree. So on the MN disk, there are also the NM. So these kind of surfaces are coupled. And the red vertices are affine copies or cut and pasted copies of uh, the four tree surface. So the key idea is that this time to use renormalization, we are not going to use which group elements because actually Diana tried to describe which group elements and she couldn't get. So they're kind of hard to describe. So the idea is to break your task into simpler moves that are not made by which group elements. But I want to go, I want to use this tree of renormalization, which goes from a green vertex to a red vertex. So this is not a which, a which group element will go from green to green. So how do I go from green to red? Well, I want to go from an MN surface to an M NM surface. So by the way, sorry, this is octagon and two squares, and this is hexagon and two triangles. And if you shear them a little bit, this is octagon and two squares, so it's S and M, and this is hexagons and two triangles, MN. So how do you go from one to another? So Hooper uh, proved that there is an affine detail from one to another. So let me show you one cartoon movie. You can straighten this picture, change the diagonals from red to green in this uh, rectangular grid, cut and paste some triangles to get the rocket. This is the rocket formation. And shear it to get back that. So that's how you go from one to another. And you see what you have to understand, it's a flip of diagonals. 
So this is the last slide I have on bomb molecules. No, not the last, the one before the last, sorry. So what do we do? We also define derivation combinatorially. I'm not going to tell you what the derivation looks like combinatorially, but our derivation goes in two steps. I want to go from MN to NM and back. So first time I derive, I'm going to send a cutting sequence of a trajectory here to a cutting sequence of a trajectory there. So derivation will map cutting sequences here to cutting sequences there. And it comes from with the recipe for substitutions. So it, if I know where the arrival, uh, the sector where the arrival direction is, and I can recover this combinatorially from transition diagrams like I did before, then I can also invert and write down explicit substitutions. And we give recipe to produce substitutions for every MN. I can find substitutions to go back. And substitution in quotation marks because, okay, uh, technical details. So what's the picture on the disk? This is the last picture, and then I have only two slides on, on hall. Okay, so that's the picture of the disk. So let me remember, green vertices are one surface, and red are the other surface. This is my trio of moves. I want to study a trajectory in direction theta. I'm going to look at a ray, geodesic ray, going to theta. And I'm going to select a path in my tree which approximates my geodesic. This will give me the renormalization moves I have to do. And again, like before, I can interpret these combinatorial derivatives as cutting sequences of the same trajectory to these sheared polygonal presentations. And here, the polygonal presentations for M and odd, so K, for K odd, they will be the formation of one surface. For K even, they will be the formation of the other surface. I always jump from one type to another type. And again, you can label this graph. Let me explain how to do that. And use the labeling of this graph to read off which substitutions you want to use. And if you like, you can interpret the action of these trio moves on the boundary as a continued fraction on directions. And these uh, substitutions you need to use are governed by the symbolic, by the entries of this generalized continued fraction for bohm Muller. Ah? Yes? Actually, this is really, I'm taking my translation surface, I have a direction. And I'm just looking at the geodesic flow, which shrinks that direction. So I'm rotating myself and applying e to the t to the minus t in that direction. And that, if I start from the, whichever convention you pick, I start from the center of the octagon, and it's going to give me a geodesic ray. So in reality, with this convention, so, you know, theta goes from 0 to pi, you do a full angle. So this would be like, if you pick a reference point, it would be like 2 theta or something explicit. But, but it's really, I want to pick the geodesic, which renormalize my linear trajectory. OK, so now I have just two slides to finish with some ideas about whole rays. So break, so break. You're lost again, and there's a last recovery point for the last idea. So again, here we want to work with the Stagmuller disk of renormalization moves. And we want to show, I will remind you what a Lagrange spectrum is, because you will have forgotten. So I take any which surface here. So I don't know the which group. I can take a fundamental domain for the which group. But we saw before that it was very nice to have uh, ideal tessellations. So what I'm going to do, if there are elliptic points, I'm going to look, unfold the elliptic points, and look at the super tessellation, which is ideal. So I notice I don't want to pass to a finite cover of my which surface, which I could. I want to study my original surface, but I'm going to use this super tessellation to code the geodesic flow. So my picture has an ideal tessellation, which could be a finite cover of my fundamental domain. And this fund ideal fundamental domain, there are gluings given by elements of the which group. And if I want to study the Lagrange value on a certain direction, again, I'm going to pick my geodesic ray, which shrinks that direction. And I want to code the geodesic ray by the sequence of sites of my tessellation hits, or by the sequence of which group elements which 
uh, glue the sides heat. And because this is an ideal tessellation, equivalently, I can look at my endpoint for my geodesic, and there will be a sequence of arcs, boundary arcs, boundary arcs here, here, and here, nested boundary arcs, which contain this point. So out of the sides of my tessellation, you should imagine this fundamental domain reflected, and I'm going to pick the arcs which cross, nested arcs which cro cross my, my ray, and uh, shrink to that point, okay? So these boundary arcs is what I'm gonna use. And if you know uh, Bowen and series boundary expansions, this is actually the easy case of Bowen series because I'm looking at an ideal tessellation. So I don't know if you know Bowen series continuous fraction. Okay, so if I have a sequence of boundary arcs which come from this ray, I'm gonna associate to boundary arcs pairs of saddle connections on my surface, like this, which contain the direction theta. So if I have a boundary arc, it has two endpoints, two angles, and I can look at, uh, actually it turns out that these vertices of my ideal tessellations correspond to directions where I have saddle connections on my surface. So these cuspital directions correspond to saddle connections. So in those directions, which are endpoints, I have set of connections, and I'm going to pick the shortest set of connection in that direction. This will give me a wedge, a pair of set of connections, which contains the vertical. And as I go to a nested arc, uh, as I go to a nested arc, I will get a, sh a shrinked wedge. So I will get a sequence of set of connections which converge to the vertical direction. Okay. It's a sequence given to me by renormalization by the Vich group. And it's a subsequence of all set of connections which approximate theta, but I claim that this set of connections see the spectrum. They see the top of the spectrum. So remember, the spectrum was uh, lim sup of one over the area of the set of connections as they approximate theta. So, so the key lemma is that there exists after, uh, the, for high values in the spectrum, after a certain L0, I can just use these wedges. I can take a direction theta and the sequence of wedges that approximate it, and only computing this area of these two set of connections, right and left, and the limit as n grows, I can compute my Lagrange spectrum. So I'm missing some set of connections, but those are the important ones to, that allows me to compute the spectrum. And this is kind of the part I wanted to tell you. This is my last slide. From here on, this proof so far is the geometric part. From here on, it goes back to kind of redoing whole argument in a new setup. So Hall uses a lot that there is a formula using continued fraction for the spectrum. So if you know the continued fraction entries of theta, the, this uh, Lagrange spectrum is the limb soup of this formula is so you have a n here, it's an integer, and then you have an infinite continued fraction of future entries and the finite backward continued fraction of this parentheses are continued fraction. So what we do, we define S continued fraction, we define uh, continued fraction in our setup, and this S stays for a modified uh, continued fraction, and we show that these areas can also be computed by <coughs> a similar formula in terms of continued fractions. And then Hall has a proof which uses arguments on sum of counter sets. You can prove that for bounded entries, uh, this tail is, corresponds to a counter set of values, these other tails correspond to another counter set. But if the counter sets are, have large halves of dimension, the sum of two counter sets contains an interval. So this is kind of redoing the counter set proofs. And, I have a hidden half slide which explains more, but I think you are all tired, and this is a good point to stop. And I showed you the geometric argument using the Teichmuller disk. So I hope I convinced you that Teichmuller disks and beach groups are useful to study dynamics on beach surfaces. Thank you. Thank you.